go outside and take a walk in your garden and you're treated to the absolute beauty and wonder nature has to offer. Plants, birds, insects and animals all sharing the same habitat and resources. There you see a crow on the top of the tree doing its or you might notice a rose plant with prickles. Look at that honeybee sucking nectar from a flower. Why do organisms live the way they do? Is there a significance behind it? Let's explore this a bit more. The freezing mountains, scorching deserts, rain-soaked forests and sea coasts. Our planet has a wide spread to offer. Life exists in all kinds of environments, from the harshest to the mildest. Yet, certain living things simply don't exist everywhere. For example, you won't get to see a penguin or a koala bear in a natural habitat anywhere in the tropical regions, would you? So what factors influence the kind of organisms we see around us? There are two kind of factors, the living factors and the non-living factors. So let's look at some of the non-living factors first as they play a very important role in influencing the kind of living organisms we see around us. As we move from the equator to the poles, the temperatures fall. Similarly, as we climb from a sea level location to a higher altitude, temperatures drop. Coastal areas have less seasonal variation in temperatures when in comparison to the interiors. While some animals can survive in a wide range of temperatures, like that annoying wall lizard you see in your homes, <laughs> the large majority of them are restricted to a narrow range. That's the reason why you don't find polar bears in a tropical climate or pigs in the Alps. Water is another very important factor that affects life on Earth. That's the reason why water is called the elixir of life as we simply cannot sustain without it. More than 70% of the Earth is water, so something should tell you that its availability shouldn't be a problem, right? Uh, not true, because a large percentage of water bodies on our planet contain salt water. Salt composition is 35% in the ocean and more than 100% in certain hypersaline water bodies. Certain aquatic organisms face osmosis problems and hence simply cannot survive in such water bodies. Sunlight is the main source of energy for organisms. Plants produce their food with the help of sunlight. For animals, the intensity of light affects their skin color while also serving as cues to time their migratory or reproductive activities. Too little sunlight causes a deficiency in vitamin D which leads to brittle, weak bones. Sunlight just doesn't act as an energy source but is also an important factor in maintaining the biological rhythm of life. If you were to visit different places in a country, you would notice different types of soils. Some are black, some are red, some are brown, some are fine-grained and some are large-grained. Factors like weather, geographical location and the history of soil formation. Like was it transported there or was it created by the weathering down of rocks over time? All of these affect soil quality and composition. The fertility of a soil, its water retention capacity and the various nutrients it has affects the growth of plants. This affects animals too. Let's suppose that you eat food produced on soil with mineral deficiencies. Wouldn't you suffer from the same lack of minerals too? Soil also affects marine life as the sediments that are present in various water bodies affect the quality of life there. Environmental disturbances such as hurricanes, tsunamis, volcanic activities largely displace organisms in any habitat. Take tsunamis for example. Some of the sea animals can be washed ashore. Land animals can be drowned or sucked into the ocean. Trees are uprooted. The soil is eroded. There is widespread damage. So when temperatures change and water dries up or sunlight becomes scarce, how do organisms respond to these harsh external conditions? 
how do living things survive deep down in the ocean floors where there's absolutely no sunlight? Well, there are two kinds of organisms. The first kind are organisms that can maintain a constant internal environment regardless of the outside condition. This condition is called homeostasis. Take human beings for example. We constantly maintain a body temperature of 37 degrees. When it's hot, we sweat, which causes our body temperature to cool. When it becomes cold, we shiver, which releases heat. In general, birds and mammals have the ability to maintain a constant body temperature. We call them regulators. The second kind are organisms whose bodies cannot maintain a constant internal environment. Their internal environment changes with the outside environment. Hence, these organisms can only survive in habitats that are optimal to their existence. Reptiles, amphibians and insects, all of these are generally conformers. We call them cold-blooded organisms. Now, most of you might think homeostasis is such a wonderful thing. So, why don't all organisms have this system? Well, it's just like saying, let's keep our air conditioner turned on 24-7 during the summer to beat the heat. But, are we all willing to pay the huge electricity bill at the end of the month? I don't think so. Similarly, a homeostasis regulation system also comes at a price. It requires the organism to take on lots of additional energy. Do you notice that you feel hungrier a lot quicker in winter than in summer? This is because your body needs lots more energy to maintain your internal body temperature in a cold climate. Not all organisms are willing to pay this price. The advantage with conformers is that they can survive with very little energy. If stressful conditions last only for a short period of time, for example, when it gets very cold in the polar regions for three months a year, several organisms employ short-term strategies to withstand these conditions. The first strategy is migration. Migration is simply saying, let me move out of this place temporarily and return when the stressful period is over. It's like you shifting to a hill station in the summer to beat the heat. Every winter, thousands of birds migrate from the cold polar regions to the milder temperate climate. Some other organisms get into the state of suspension during unfavorable conditions where their metabolic activity is reduced to an absolute minimum. Take bears for example. They fatten up and hibernate during the entire winter period, surviving only on the reserves. Reptiles like snakes also hibernate during the winter season where their metabolic activity is an absolute minimum. All these attributes that enable organisms to better survive in their environment are called adaptations. We human beings have adapted very well to our habitat, haven't we? Air conditioners, warm clothes, umbrellas, suntan lotions. These are all examples of adaptations. Some of the other organisms in our environment have also developed some fascinating attributes to adapt to their habitats. Take the elephant ear plant in the tropical forest. The thing with the tropics is that only 3% of the sun's rays actually reach the forest floor because of the dense foliage. These trees have leaves that can reach 3 meters long and 2 meters wide which enable the plant to absorb more sunlight. The kangaroo rat in the North American deserts meets all its water requirements by oxidizing its internal fat which produces water. It also concentrates its urine so that minimum water is utilized for excretion. The arctic fox changes its coat with seasons. During the summer months, the fox has a thin gray undercoat which helps it camouflage with the surroundings. During the winter, the fox develops a thick white coat that not only keeps it warm but also allows it to blend with the surroundings, camouflaging itself from predators. So, do these adaptations happen in a month or a year? If we were to grow a banana plantation in Canada, do you think it would survive there? Probably not. Such adaptations happen over generations and generations as the organism learns and trains itself to effectively survive in its habitat. <laughs>